from the people who turned a niche Scottish football podcast into a critically acclaimed TV show on the BBC. It's Review from the Terrace, a pop culture podcast network. Hello and welcome to the Still Game podcast. My name is Bethany Tennick. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Scottish Rewatchable. Hello and welcome to Review from the Turnbuckle. Debating the best in movies, iconic TV shows, classic albums, peak era wrestling and so much more. Some intern got fired for that. Like, <laughs> I'd be like, Jared! And what would you have done? <laughs> Loved it. What a moment. What a moment. Review from the the Terrace brings together a collection of professionals, pals, misfits and special guest interviews. The one and only Ewan Angus, Big G Telfer, Director of Slow Games, Michael Hines. That's Review from the Terrace, a newly created podcast network with at least two shows dropping every week. All right, neighbor, good to see you, man. Good to see you, man. It's been a long time, man. <laughs> Many people will say it's the biggest moment in the history of this. It's about 35. <laughs> <laughs> Find us on Acast or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to the Man City Show. It's Nigel Rothman back in the chair. And what a sporting weekend it was. And it's difficult to decide, really, the biggest sporting story for me. Was it qualifier Emma Raducanu winning the US Open? Or was it the story of the Portuguese, whose destination was uncertain until a few days ago, scoring to give his side victory at the weekend? Well, I'm going with Raducanu, but Bernardo Silva ran her very close with his winning goal and his all-round display against Leicester City. See what I did there? Yeah. Uh, To discuss that and much more, I've got three guests. Welcome to my good mate, Roger Reid. Hi, Rog. Good to see you, everybody. And welcome to Joe Doherty, wearing a 1991 Manchester City brother shirt, looking very smart. Welcome, Joe. Hey, Nigel. And a view from a blue. Welcome also to Stephen Allwise. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Nigel. Listen, Stephen, let, let's start with, with Bernardo, because uh, in all seriousness, his, his future was uncertain. People said he he was going to go, probably should have gone. What, what does he give us that Grealish doesn't give us, etc.? But but what a performance. Well, I, I, I'm going to correct you very early on in the podcast. I don't think fans were saying that. I don't think any fan really wanted to see him leave or questioned his abilities. It was more a case from his side of, was he happy? Being in Manchester, was he happy maybe not playing every minute of every game? But his quality is is there for everyone to see. He's absolutely brilliant. And I thought against Leicester, he was back to the Bernardo of a couple of years ago when he was our player of the season and everything good went through him. Um, whether he was um, in midfield and drifting forward and drifting to the left to link up with Grealish or we know how good he is on the right wing and kind of the link up with other players. I think he's absolutely brilliant as a footballer and so pleased that he stayed with us this year. I think he's going to be key. And Joe, you, you as, a, as always, were there um, away. I saw lots of photos um, of you having a good time, looking completely sober uh, as normal. <laughs> um, it, it, how did you see the, the performance from, from Bernardo? I, I honestly, I thought he was absolutely brilliant, um, like Stephen was saying. Um, I said to people as the game was going on, one of the best bits of business we've done this summer. Obviously, we've come under quite a lot of scrutiny for players we maybe haven't signed. But one of the best bits of business, in my opinion, was keeping him at the club. Because there's not only has he got so much quality, like you say, he links the play well with all sorts of players. He covers every blade of grass on that pitch. He, like, you know, and he doesn't, um, He's you you can have someone who's a very hardworking player, but he's both hardworking and he, he sort of covers everywhere across that midfield and that front line. He'll be out on the left playing Grealish. He'll be out on the right um, playing in Jesus. I, I honestly thought he really deserved that goal at the weekend. But even if it, if, even hypothetically, if it had not been him that scored it, I still thought he would have been, you know, shooing for man of the match for us. I thought he, he just had one of those displays where everything good went through him and he just wanted the ball at all times. And now... You see this a bit when you've got players that want to leave. Are their hearts going to be in it anymore? I don't think there's a problem there with Bernardo at all. Rog, Stephen quite rightly corrected me, as he does most weeks when he's on, to be fair. That's why I don't invite him on. (laughs) Um, But but a lot of people did argue that if we're going to get Grealish, well, they do a similar job, I suppose. Um, Do you have a view on that? Do you think there is a difference? I think we've got the benefit of two great players, clearly. But what what, what does he offer that maybe 
Grealish doesn't. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with both Stephen and Joe so far in that keeping him was like having a major new signing with us. The only doubts I've heard about Bernardo, and you can understand it to a certain extent, is obviously with his, his background in Portugal and with the weather such as it is in Portugal, it isn't half a change moving to Manchester for, in terms of the weather, <laughs> the weather forecast and so on. And I can imagine it must be quite difficult living in a quite a grey, rainy city, having been in Portugal most of your life. So I, I think that's the only real issue that Bernardo's ever ever had. He loves his teammates. He loves playing under Guardiola. He is by far one of the best readers of a game, the best first touches of a game. He's probably the most skillful player we've got on our books. Uh, he, he's a fantastic player, and he, he, he's one of he's certainly one of my favourites. So I'm, I'm delighted he's staying with us, and I think he'll be a key player for us, as I think all our players are going to be, because as I've said, we are short of our 25 man squad. Uh, just just on that, then before before we carry on, just on the 25 man squad, it, it's a maximum of 25. We don't we're not. It's not imperative that we get up to 25. What, what are your concerns particularly then, Roger? Well, my big concerns are that you, you, your sort of expectations this season are that City are going to play 60 games or somewhere near 60 games. We've got less players than the other big clubs have got. You know, I'm afraid we're, we're, we're seeing four clubs almost now becoming a Super League within the Premier League, which are Liverpool, United, Chelsea and, and City. They've all got 25-man squads. And the 25-man squad is made up of over 21-year-old players. So the under-21s don't count. You can play them anyway. They don't count in your squad. So those are the three clubs. They've all got 25-man squads, where we've got 22-man squad, which includes three goalkeepers and Benjamin Mendy, whose future we don't know about. So our squad, our squad depth is automatically lower than our other three main competitors or rivals. So that's my concern. I, I, I mean, I'm old enough in the tooth, long enough in the tooth to remember the 1970-71 season, which you probably remember, Nigel. And that was when we had so many injuries at the end of the season. We ended up playing Chelsea in the European Cup Winners' Cup semi-final. And we had six or seven first-team players injured who weren't available to play. And we ended up playing a lot of the youngsters at that time. And Forgive me, but that's my worry that we end up with playing, having to play youngsters because of injuries to some of our senior players. Are you concerned equally, Stephen? Does it worry you that we're slightly light? We've got some quality within that, of course. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty clear we're light in a couple of key positions, fullback being one, because you know we probably went into the window thinking we need to sign a left back who is top quality. We didn't. We've lost one of the the options to play there so we're basically down to three fullbacks um to cover the whole season in Zinchenko Cancelo Walker you may get you know, Laporte Ake can fill in for a couple of games here and there if needed but it's not a long-term solution so that's one position and the other obvious position is striker where we were clearly after somebody we haven't brought anyone in and we've now got you know a few players who can do a job there but no one who's going to bang in 2025 a season so there's areas where we're weak but you also look at the squad as a whole and there is immense quality you know we might not be able to field two 11s that you know given we might not have that 23rd or 24th player but the kind of the core players the the 17 18 19 players that pet will rely on could all be in our first 11 and you'd barely notice that difference in quality and i think someone like a Liverpool maybe don't have that strength in depth United probably don't have that Chelsea are the ones I think do you know they've really strengthened and and do have a squad but we'll see Pep is brilliant at managing that that group of players and you know we'd love to be in the position as Rob said we'd love to be playing 60 61 games a season because that means we're getting through to the last stages of all the different competitions. Mm -hmm. Uh, Joe Roger's concerned about numerical situation we're a bit like Stephen's talked about the left back situation uh, I, he's also mentioned the striker as well um, the statistics speak for themselves 11 goals more than any other team in the league and from nine different players uh, which uh, which is an interesting statistic I mean we, we could go through the season like that we, we've had seasons very recently where we've had goals coming not just from the front line but midfielders all pitching in 
etc. Your, your thoughts about our shortcomings? Are you wor- what are you most worried about? Is it is it the fullback situation? Is it the striker situation? Where, where, or is it just the shortage of numbers? Where do you sit? I guess the striker situation is a bit of a worry. And granted, like you said, we've had two games already this year where we've scored five goals. And we've had, obviously, goals being chipped in by midfielders, even a couple by defenders. But I do worry that there are certain games. And I think Leicester could have been that game on another on another day. Obviously, who, who cares? We won 1-0. But there were chances we had that you think Torres, Jesus, that they, they had good games, but they're not putting these chances in the net. And you do sometimes think if we still had an Aguero or if we signed a Kane or someone like that, these games might be more comfortable. And you, you just... I worry about playing Chelsea or Liverpool or United away, a game where we really need to get points if we want to, you know, get on with the title race and really and really push ahead in that. That um, that, that that shortcoming will cost us a bit. Um, obviously, the fullback situation isn't ideal either, but I, I I have I'm less concerned about someone like Laporte playing left back or us changing the formation a bit, perhaps than I am about just the fact that there isn't an out-and-out striker there. And I think that that is going to to come to bite us at some point this season, to be honest. And you look at Chelsea, who already had Werner, who could have been a second-season player, but that wasn't even good enough. They went and bought Lukaku. So it is something I'm a little concerned about early days. OK, let, let's talk, I think every week so far this season, I've managed to find a slot for, for Grealish as well. So I'm just going to throw it in the mix as well. He, 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 he did cost us a bit of money, so let's just have a little bit of air time for him. Uh, and really, Stephen, more to do with his actual performance because he took his defensive duties very seriously. He was busting a gut in the 95th minute, uh, which he got applauded for by Pep, etc. And, and, and you really had a, a, another great game for City. Your, your thoughts in terms of what he, what he brings and, and how impressed you've been of him? He looks as if he's been playing in this team for, for years, which actually says everything about his quality. Um, the fact that he can... You know, I think it makes sense probably for Pep to put him out on the wing initially. Um, you know, some people thought, will he play one of the two central attacking midfield roles? But I think it's probably easier for him on on the left where he can link up with all the different options around it. Um, but he's so comfortable on the ball. He's always looking for that pass or that moment he can break through the lines. Um, he's going to see a lot of possession as that's the way we play and he's going to have chances to be creative. Um, but he just suits it. He suits receiving the ball under pressure, giving it, playing the easy passes, waiting for that right moment just to play the killer pass. Um, and as you you said, in um, you know that lung bursting run back in the injury time to win possession and and stop a potential counter attack is is exactly what Pep wants from those players. It's not enough. I think we saw it maybe in Mara's first year. It's not enough just to be good on the ball and happy going forward. You've got to do the defensive work. Amaras has improved in that respect. Somebody like De Bruyne, for all his quality, works as hard as anyone else. We've touched on it already with Bernardo. And I think we saw that with Grealish. He's really sort of got to impact both ends of the pitch. And, and I think it's been a really, really impressive start for him so far. What excites you most, Rog? It's, it's a big price tag, 100 million. Um, he will get abuse from fans from other sides, of course, just because of that price tag. What, what excites you most about him joining joining? City? Oh, listen, he's he's exciting to watch, isn't he? And he, I mean, he, you've only got to look at the Euros and the games he played for England in the summer to see how much England fans were excited by him when he was when he was coming on as a as, as a substitute. I, I go back to I used to work with a wonderful guy called Ken Barnes, who was our most uh, best uncapped England midfield player of the fifties. And uh, Ken was chief scout at Main Road many years ago. And he always used to say to me that you never, never, ever need to worry about players' positions because if they're good players, they can play anywhere. Uh, And that's why I think our 22 players, if you like, or 21 if you take Benjamin Mendy out of the equation, uh, I I think quality against the other squads, there's no question. And and I think Stephen touched on that before, that the quality is is absolutely there for all to see. And Grealish brings that top quality to the squad. Um, my concern is still about the, the threat of injuries to two or three players, which suddenly reduces the impact and forces you to play your hand. It forces you to play your, 
your youngsters. I think, if, going back to what we were saying before, I think Pep in his own mind is probably leaning towards playing the kids in the in the League Cup game, certainly the early rounds, because he wants to give his regular squad a little bit of a break. Um, I, and that would include Grealish, of course. Sure. All right, well, listen, we're going to talk about the top four that's already been mentioned. We'll look forward to the Champions League tie against RB Leipzig on Wednesday and the fixture against Southampton at the weekend. And we'll do all of that straight after this break. Welcome back. We've just talked about the top four. Uh, as it stands, it includes City, Liverpool, Stratford and Chelsea. Um, clearly, before the season start, they were kind of nailed on top four favourites as well. Um, so no surprise there. Is that, Joe, how you see it staying? Is that kind of our top four already there? See anybody else creeping into that? The mighty Arsenal, maybe? They've won at the weekend. They're on, the <laughs> way, on their way back. No, I can't really. And to be honest, I've spent all of the last few weeks, um, everyone I've spoken to about it, City fans, United fans, Chelsea, we're all pretty certain that we are going to end up being the top four. But we've had, we've all said, I don't even want to predict the order, order yet. <laughs> I think it could really be any order. I, I do think Chelsea are the team I'm most worried about. You can't write Liverpool off, but I don't think their squad's Deep and as deep enough, and I think we've touched on it. And United, obviously, bias aside, with Ronaldo in the side, they're always going to be a threat. But I still don't think their midfield is strong enough, and I really don't think their manager's good enough. So I could see come the end of the season, it may be being a bit more us and Chelsea, Liverpool without injuries. But um, I, I do think we've got the potential to have a very exciting. Uh, backwards and forwards title race between four teams rather than two this year. And I suppose, obviously, <laughs> be nice. It's always nice to see your team winning, do well. But I suppose it would it it feels more satisfying at the end of it. You feel like you've fought off some real competition, and I think we'd have to do that this year. Rog, would you agree that Chelsea's probably the Thomas Tuchel's got them playing the beats in the Champions League? Seems to beat us every time we play them at the moment. Of course, um, they do look a threat. They've they've invested, got a great striker. They do look probably favourites, would you say? Or, or just, do you see another side creeping in there? Yeah, fractionally. I, th- I think the, the c- thing that I've got a concern about is United because they've, they've now added goal power. Um, so, you know, I, th- I think they they are going to score a lot more goals than they have done the previous couple of seasons. So I think they're going to be uh, a threat in there as well. Uh, Chelsea, yeah, in terms of the, the all-round squad, they're, they're probably going to be up there. Uh, and my only concern, really, is, is about the Premier League, and that is that I think there is going to be a gap between the top four and the rest. Um, last year, we had Leeds, one or two others that were, you know, in good runs. I can see them finishing probably mid-table. Um, you can see already that it's going to be a struggle for the likes of Norwich. I've got to say, by the way, football fans do make me laugh. I thought that was fantastic to hear the Arsenal fans were, sing- were singing "We're staying up after beating Norwich on uh, on Saturday." That's fantastic humour from football fans, <laughs> and you get that the world over. I think that's brilliant. But yeah, no, my concern is about the big four, and the, and, and I think there will be a gap between those four and the rest. Is that how you see it, Stephen? Yeah, but I was just thinking actually, it makes the games against the likes of Leicester and um, Spurs. I know we lost, but the West Ham's, who are probably going to be fifth to tenth yeah. whatever order they they turn up it makes those games even more important because you can see the top four are probably going to drop points against each other that's just the nature of how those big games mm. work and then you'd imagine on paper and we know it doesn't work like this but on paper you should beat the bottom few teams quite easily and so it's just those next bunch the kind of Leeds, Leicester's, Spurs, West Ham's, Everton's who are Arsenal, who will probably occupy that sort of sixth or seventh places, mm. you've got to perform against them. And I think Leicester are a really good team. We saw that, well, we know we've had difficulties against them in the past and the way that they can soak up pressure and then just hit you on the counter in an instant and the way that they can pass the ball out from the back and beat the press. They did it a couple of times and you know Vardy was narrowly ruled offside. But we actually, I thought, limited their threat really well. I think we were in control. We managed the, the counter-attacks. We didn't allow them to get in behind us too often. And I think it it was just hopefully lays down that marker for the rest of the season that 
we've not been too scratchy. I know we lost against Spurs first game, but I thought we played okay in the circumstances of missing all of our stars who got to the Euro final. And actually, you know, you just want us to kick on now and, and not have the disruption maybe of the international break and other cup competitions coming in. It's it's really just a time for us to get our heads down and just churn out win after win after win, which we know we can do. Well, with that in mind, we've got a big game coming up on Wednesday. Uh, Rog, your, your thoughts ahead of that? Uh, obviously, Pep has managed to have a fairly stable side for the Premier League games. Mm. Uh, your thoughts ahead of this one in terms of... Yeah, of team? Uh, well, I, again, I've, I've heard that we've got a 22-man squad, a uh, 22-man squad name for, for the Champions League, which includes this Romeo Lavia who I understand that I haven't seen him play, but I understand he's a defensive midfield player. So I'm presuming that he would be cover for Fernandinho or, or, or Rodri and therefore may well be in, you know, may, may even play in, in the Champions League, in certain Champions League games. Um, I, I think we'll be all right. I mean, obviously we're, we're, we're in a tough group in the sense that we've got PSG to, uh, to, to finish above or, or finish second to, but I, I think we'll qualify for the later stages. Uh, I don't see Bruges or Leipzig as a real threat um, and hopefully we'll come through without injuries again. Um, so, yeah, high, high hopes that we will qualify for the later stages. And Stephen, I know you're the font of all knowledge when it comes to European football and you're a, 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 an expert of uh, RB Leipzig and have written many articles about them. You're, give, give, give us everything you know about RB Leipzig ahead of the game then this week, please, Stephen. I know you're a huge expert in the area. Absolutely. Uh, Angelino? I think that's the the end of my knowledge. Um, <laughs> no, I think that it's a tricky group because they're a, a good pot three team. Sort of, they've got the potential on the day to play really nice football and upset us. The, we'd all imagine that us and PSG would be the top two in the group. Um, but I, th- I think it almost offers Pep a chance, whilst we still only have one game per week up to now in the the Premier League, it almost gives him a chance in the Champions League to bring in somebody like Stones, who's not played so much, or bring in somebody like De Bruyne if he wants to give him some match fitness and Mares and Sterling haven't featured from the start. So you can make those changes and not really weaken the team in any way. Foden's another one who's coming back from his injuries. So I think at this stage... um, it gives Pep the chance to make a few changes and get some minutes into other people's legs, knowing, though, that, that Leipzig are, are a dangerous team, albeit having lost their manager to Bayern um, over the close season. Joe, who do you expect to kind of see being rested and maybe who, who might we see coming in on Wednesday night? See, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we will rest players as much. I think it's more likely that um, it'll be against Southampton they get rested. Uh, Pep has shown... It, I remember last season, even though it felt a lot of the time that we needed points more in the league games than the Champions League games, it did feel like Pep was still just trying to get that group one as quickly as possible. So it really wouldn't surprise me if we go in with... I, I, I expect a couple of changes, perhaps, but it really wouldn't surprise me to see more or less the same team featuring against Leipzig. And then maybe your is and some of these players coming in against um, against Southampton and then possibly giving them a half against Wickham just to get them sort of back in the groove a bit before playing pretty much what I think we'll have as our best eleven against Chelsea. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the players um, who featured on the weekend will play on Wednesday. You know, it's not too... It's not... In terms of the context of playing weekend to midweek, it's not that small a gap. There are a reasonable number of days. So uh, I, I'm... I'm thinking more ahead to Southampton where I think we'll rest more players. Uh, I just think Pep likes to get the Champions League games early on, one and out of the way as quickly as possible. And an easy victory for City, you reckon, Wednesday night before we look forward to the weekend in Southampton, Joe? Mm, I, I think we probably should win. Um, as Stephen said, Leipzig have lost their manager and I believe they've lost a couple of their key players to Bayern as well. Uh, they're just falling victims to the classic Bayern transfer plan of who's our biggest rivals in the league will buy their best players. Um, so I, I think we should probably beat them. Um, 3-1, I'll go with. All right. OK. Let's look forward then to the weekend, uh, finally, before we depart for another week. Uh, Southampton it is. Uh, Stephen, your, your thoughts ahead of the Southampton game? Yeah, I, I actually worry for Southampton this season. Um, once they lost 
Ings, who it felt like, you know, at times was their only goal threat. I thought, and they lost, is it Vestergaard um, to Leicester as well? I, I, I sort of worry for them a little bit. I think they might be candidates to go down, but, you know, they've brought in Armstrong from Blackburn, who who seems to have, have hit the ground running. Again, it's it's another game that we probably should win um, fairly comfortably, but we've had our issues with Southampton in the past and relied on late, late goals. I think there was one from Sterling that was um, additional time a couple of years ago and, and we saw Mendy running down the touchline when he was still on his crutches or recovering from ACL. So Southampton have proven they can be quite stubborn opponents for us, but again, it's, it's a game you'd expect us uh, to win and one that we probably need to. So a stoppage time winner then, you think, again, possibly is on the card, Stephen? Yeah, maybe maybe one of those goals in overtime just to, to clinch the three points. As long as it's not injury time, I'd be very happy. Rog, your, your thoughts on the Southampton game? Yeah, I'm just smiling to myself because Stephen, as ever, is always uh, on the ball, as you know. I remember that game. Fantastic. Actually, you probably don't remember, Van Dijk played in that game. Uh, and they defended really resolutely Southampton for, for most of the game. And then obviously Raheem came up with that winner. But yeah, what a game. Um, I, I go back, I think Stephen's already made the point about the teams that are going to finish fifth to 15th, if you like. The problem that they have is that although they may have in, improved their squads, they don't yet live up to the billing of having the consistency of the four that we've talked about, the top four that I believe will finish in the top four this year. And it means that they may nick the odd result here and there, but consistency is that they're just not going to beat Chelsea, Liverpool, United and City. They're just simply not capable of doing that. Southampton are one of those teams. Now, obviously, therefore, the expectation is that we're going to win on Saturday, who knows? Who knows? Yeah, fingers crossed. Let's have a prediction then from, from you, Roger. We've had 3-1 against Leipzig from Joe. Let's have your Champions League and your Premier League predictions and see who gets closest. I, I think Leipzig will win 2-0, Southampton 2-1. Joe, so your Southampton prediction and then we'll finish with Stevens too. Well, I, I agree with Stephen in that I really worry about them this season and I, and I agree with Roger about that. I just don't think they've got the consistency. Um, we have had our troubles against Southampton in the past. I mean, that Gareth Barry own goal down at their place uh, was one of the least fun days of when I was 15. Um, but <laughs> when I think back to the games where we've struggled against them, I just can't help thinking they've been a much better team. Like As Rog touched on, Van Dijk played in that 2-1 game, which obviously changes things massively. But now they've even lost Vestergaard, who's not as good as that. I would be very surprised if we didn't win at least 3-0 at the weekend. I mean, now I've said that, they're going to win 1-0 from a penalty. <laughs> <laughs> do, you want, do you want to share any of your least fun things as a 15-year-old, or should we leave that for a, a different <laughs> podcast? <laughs> no, no, I'm going to, can, we, can I just say the FA Cup final against Wigan and then leave it there? That wasn't a great day, was it? I seem to remember. <laughs> Not a good day. Right. I, I think it was pretty bad, wasn't it? I just want to leave the, the 15-year-old Joe Doherty to one side for now, I think, <laughs> as quickly as we possibly can. Steve, I think, I think the parents do as well. Steve. Steve. I, let's move on. I think Leipzig might be 2-1. I think it might be tighter than, than we probably want it to be. Southampton, I'd say 3-0, 4-0. I think we might score a few. Fantastic. Thank you very much to my three guests, to Roger Reeve to Stephen Allwise and the 15-year-old Joe Doherty. This is Nigel Rothman saying thanks for listening and we'll talk to you very soon. If you'd like to advertise on or sponsor this show, contact us at playbackmedia.co.uk.